In this video, we're going to consider how to categorize the various forces that go into Newton's second law. Newton's second law is the thing we're going to be using a lot to solve mathematical problems. But we should remember that Newton's laws of motions are all interrelated. So for an example, the first law, we're not going to ignore it because we need to be careful using the frame of reference to measure an acceleration of an object. Namely, we're going to need to make sure all the frames of references we use are inertial frames of reference where the first law applies, namely an object at rest stays at rest. In addition, all of the forces that go into calculating the net force must obey the third law, or they must be part of an interaction with another physical object. This is what Newton meant by a force. The mass that goes in here is the mass of a specific object. All these forces act on the inertia of this object, and that is the object's acceleration. It is important to realize that the mass or the inertia is not a force that must be overcome to set an object into motion. Rather, it is the property of an object that restricts the rate at which its motion changes. Now, the way we're going to categorize the forces that go into Newton's second law is primary forces, which are your basic fundamental forces, and they always act at a distance. That'll be gravity, electricity, and magnetism. Gravity is the only one we're going to be considering in this class. Then there are other forces that are basically just the consequence of the atomic model of matter. Namely, these are forces that are too complicated to deal with in a direct or fundamental way. Rather, we're going to use experiments to determine how they work. And there'll be things like friction, and we'll categorize them by the coefficient of friction. And we'll have air resistance, which we'll categorize by things like drag coefficients. But they all come from the basic na nature that all matter is made up of atoms. Then the last force, which is often some of the more confusing ones, we really are just going to make some simplifying assumptions about the solid objects that we'll be dealing with. Things like cords and ropes and chains and whatnot, we will assume are perfectly rigid in the sense that they will not stretch or their lengths will not change. So if we use a rope to connect two objects, we'll assume those two objects are always the same distance apart. Any surfaces we put objects on, we'll assume they won't bend, or objects can only move parallel to the surface. Those constraints will, in fact, determine the values of some of the forces we'll consider. Now, consider a solid object right here, whose mass is m. We want to identify all the different interactions with its surroundings so we can calculate this net force. Well, as I just mentioned, we can have things that are in immediate contact and things that are not. Well, things that it can be in contact with could be another solid, or it could be a fluid, a liquid or a gas. Those solids could be rigid, other solid objects, or they could be things like ropes or springs that are flexible. If it's in contact with a rigid object, those will either exert normal forces or frictional forces. Ropes will exert tensional forces. Springs will exert elastic or Hooke's law forces. Fluids can exert either a buoyant force or a drag force. Then we can look at things it's not in contact with, and they can exert for forces by virtue of both objects having mass, and that'll be a gravitational force. If they have electrical charges, they can exert electric or magnetic forces. Each one of these has been color-coded in terms of the type of force it is. So these blue forces right here are all fundamental forces. These purple forces are all the secondary forces, or the ones that come indirectly from the atomic structure of matter. And the other forces right here, which are supposed to be in orange, those are the constraint forces. One important thing is notice we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine forces. If there were many, many different ways in which objects could interact with their surroundings, so the list of possible forces that could go into Newton's second law was extremely long, this would not be a very useful way to organize how objects interact with their surroundings to change each other's state of motion. Because these forces are a relatively short list, this is, in fact, a useful way to structure our understanding of how the world works. Now we can look at five of those forces. Those are the five forces that you looked at briefly in the field of forces activity. 
and go through, since they're all vectors, what is their magnitude and what is their direction. For the time being, we're going to consider weight to only be the force of gravity near the surface of a planet, and specifically the Earth. So the magnitude of that force will just be the weight of the object, or its mass, times g. Now, g should formally be seen here as the fact the Earth exerts a force of 9.8 newtons on every kilograms of matter near the surface. This produces an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. Now, later in the year, we'll look at a more involved form for the force of gravity, where we're no longer constrained to be near the surface of a planet. We could be a great distance away. Then we'll run across Newton's universal law of gravity. And this g right here is a fundamental constant. This little g right here depends on where you are. So it only takes on the value of 9.8 near the surface of the Earth. And of course, the direction of gravity is always vertically down or towards the center of the Earth. Now, the normal force is one of those constraint forces. Its magnitude will be whatever is required to keep the surface from bending. And we will simply assume force, that the surfaces will not bend. They're perfectly rigid. The direction will always be perpendicular to the surface. And the reason we have the normal force is we're going to assume that the solids that we're going to be putting our objects on will resist being compressed. Tension is another constraint force. We will assume that it will exert whatever force is necessary to keep a length of rope fixed. We may provide a maximal tension so that if the force required exceeds a certain value, then the string will break. Its direction will always be along the length of the rope. And this comes from the fact that solids, due to their atomic structure, will also resist being stretched. Friction is one of the uh, empirical forces, and we get it by simply observing that when you rub two surfaces together, they resist the motion. In specific, if I take one object and I pull on it, so this is the force I am applying, and I apply it, I notice it doesn't move as I pull up until some certain maximum value right here. Then all of a sudden, the object will break loose and will start to move. So this region right here, the objects are not moving. This region right here, they are moving relative to each other. This we're going to call kinetic friction when they are moving. When they're not moving, we're going to call static friction. Notice all along here, the net force acting on the object is zero. The object is at rest and remaining at rest. It will do so up until I apply a certain maximum value. And this is how we're going to characterize static friction. What is the maximum value for static friction? Once it starts moving, friction takes on a more or less constant value as the two surfaces move together. And we will call that value the coefficient of kinetic friction. So static friction will have a maximum value. And we'll say the static friction is always less than or equal to the coefficient of static friction and a product of that and the normal force how hard the two surfaces are pressed together. These are, coefficients are simply numbers we measure. They come from things like, what is the texture of the surface? What is the composition of the surface? And that's one, a number we just measure. There's no theoretical value as to why it takes on a certain number and not another. The direction will always be parallel to the surface and opposing whatever applied force is trying to set it into motion. So the net force is zero. Kinetic friction has a similar a structure, except now it's equal because it's a constant. It has a different coefficient because generally speaking, this number right here, the coefficient of kinetic friction, is less than the coefficient of static friction. That is not always the case. There are substances where the kinetic is actually larger than the static. That is a little unusual, but these are both numbers we just do experiments on and measure. And like the static friction, the kinetic friction is directly proportional to how hard the surfaces are pressed together. And like static, it's parallel to the surface, only now it's going to oppose whatever motion or velocity they have. Kinetic and static friction both depend directly on how, how hard the two surfaces are pressed together, or the normal force. They will depend on the texture or the composition of the surfaces. And the only other thing they depend on are the two surfaces moving or not, whether we have kinetic or static. It is interesting to note that friction does not depend on the amount of surface area in contact. 
This is an, something that we basically determine by doing experiments. People are actually currently working on trying to figure out exactly why this is the case. In addition, it does not depend on the value of their relative motion, only are they at rest or not. Once they're moving, kinetic friction has a constant value, and that's one thing you'll look at. The last of our forces is air resistance, which can be abbreviated as just drag. We're going to break that into two different types of drag. One is when we're at very low velocity, and if you're at low velocity, then the air will flow over an object. This could be a baseball, and this is the air flowing over it at more or less in layers, or what is called laminar flow. Under those conditions, the drag force is directly proportional to the velocity and is opposite in direction to the velocity. Now, it turns out for air, the speed is ridiculously small. This is not something that is typically satisfied, and therefore, this has very little practical use. We're going to use it only because the mathematics of using this with Newton's laws of motion are a little more easy to handle, and it also has a lot of the same properties as the more realistic one, the turbulent flow. As the speed gets bigger, the air no longer wraps around and keeps nice even layers like it does here. Instead, it breaks up and we have turbulent or chaotic flow behind the, the object. Then the magnitude of the force is equal to one-half times the drag coefficient, which depends on the shape of the object, the density of the air, the cross-sectional area of the object, which is the area here. It is not the surface area, but it is the cross-sectional area, and not the velocity, but the square of the velocity. So in short, the air resistance depends on the size of the object, or how much air has to get pushed out of the way, the shape of the object, which determines the drag coefficient, or how aerodynamic the object is, how efficiently it can push the air out of the way, and the speed of the object relative to the air, which is how rapidly do I have to push that air out of the way to go through it, and obviously also depends on how dense the air is. Now, for any force that depends on velocity, eventually this force can become large enough to equal the force of gravity on the object if we're dropping it. When that happens, the net force goes to zero, the object stops speeding up, and the velocity at which that happens is called the terminal velocity. We can investigate terminal velocities by simply using Stokes' law, well, which is not physically reasonable, but does have the same mathematical properties that this turbulent air resistance has. And that will still give us a lot of the correct understanding as to how air resistance works. Now, the reason we're doing all of this is to have a way of which we can organize the forces acting on an object. And here we'll have an object, a stone, which is sitting on a surface and attached to a rope, and we are told that it is in equilibrium, which means the object is at rest and will stay at rest. To organize the forces, what you should always have in mind are these five forces, and you'll look at each one of them and ask, okay, does the object have weight? Well, Almost all objects will be near the surface of the Earth and will have a weight, and that's always vertically down. Note it is not perpendicular to the surface, it is vertically down. Then you'll ask, is the object sitting on a surface? And here it is, it's at rest on a surface. The normal force is at right angles to the surface, it is not vertically up. It is at right angles to the surface. The surface is at an angle, then so is the normal force. Then you can look, okay, are any strings or ropes attached to it? If they are, there'll be a tensional force, which will be along the length of the rope, like it is right here, and it will simply be whatever is required to keep the length of this rope constant. Then you'll ask, okay, is there any evidence we have friction? Well, here we are told the surface is frictionless, so we do not need to worry about friction. Then we'd ask, okay, do we have to worry about any air resistance? Well, here we have an object that is in equilibrium and is at rest. It will not be moving relative to the air, so we do not need to worry about air resistance. Once we've identified these forces, we can also note the object is in equilibrium, so all of those forces must add up to zero. That is one way we can determine the value of the tensional force and the value of the normal force, because they have to add up to a force that's exactly equal and opposite to the weight.